Jake here. Thank you for taking a trip to the past with me. The original podcast version of The Americans will be released weekly, but if you don't want to wait, then go to jakebible.substack.com and become a paid subscriber. You'll receive access to all of The Americans as well as early release novels, audiobooks, and other exclusive extras. That's jakebible.substack.com. Now enjoy the original podcast production of The Americans. Cheers. Warning. This podcast reading is for mature audiences only. You will not be warned again. Welcome to the podcast reading of Jake Bible's The Americans, book two in the Dead Mech Apex Trilogy. The Americans is a side quill to Dead Mech, meaning it takes place simultaneously with book one. You can listen to this novel first or start with Dead Mech. Go to jakebible.com for more information on this podcast, Dead Mech, and other fiction by Jake Bible. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Americans. This is the final episode. Pretty crazy, huh? The final episode of The Americans. So this is my final intro for a while. A um, little bit of news before we get into this very last episode of the novel. Uh, I will be podcasting the next novel. All right, and there'll be more details coming on. Uh, like I said in the previous one, um, David Sobkowiak has you know been so gracious to help out. That is that is unbelievable. So he is going to produce me some audio, and that's pretty sweet. Um, the other thing is is uh, Stark is fully funded. So everybody who contributed to that Kickstarter campaign, you are awesome. Thank you so much. It is fully funded. There is some money left over for um, starting into Rash, which is the next novella, and then into Done. Well, not enough to go into Done, but some to start into Rash, and and we'll see how that goes. It's this one's going to be you know an experiment. I'm going to see what the expenses are, how it all works, and um, the process and everything. So hopefully it'll go fine. Hopefully it will sell. <laughs> I will make announcements. You know, maybe I will uh, put out a short fiction podcast for a little bit. Who knows what's going to happen. But definitely stay tuned to jakebible.com for information on Stark. Um, also, I released a short story, Horror Western, uh, The Man With No Face. So if you want to check that out, it is available on Barnes & Noble. It's available on Amazon.com. It's available on Smashwords. So just look me up, Jake Bible, on either of those, and you will find The Man With No Face. It is a fun little horror western. I think you guys will like it. It's 99 cents. Go get you some. Maybe I will podcast that, and that will announce um, some Stark stuff, and, you know, just to kind of keep things going. We'll see. We'll see. Yes, we will. Um... Most of all, I want to thank everybody for all of your support throughout this novel. Thank you to all my fans and readers out there. Um, your enthusiasm has been outstanding. To all the other writers out there, all the other podcasters who have helped me get the word out, who have just helped me in general, you guys are awesome. I know I owe you promo space. You will get paid promo space. I just have not had time, energy, brain power to get promos together at the ends of these podcasts just because I have not been organized on that. I suck. It's true. We all know it. All right. So what you going to do? Anyway, yeah, I just got to say thank you to everybody. You guys rock. You guys are awesome. Um, yeah, and I think that's about it. I don't think I'm going to ramble much. I believe I may put out a QA. and a I may not. Um, we'll see. This all depends again on time. Right now, my focus is going to be on getting Stark out, getting all those illustrations into the ebook, making sure the formatting works, making sure just it all works and is publishable. So that's where my focus is going to be on that and then writing and writing and writing and writing. <laughs> so there we go. And that's about it. This is the last episode, y'all. It's been a crazy trip. This is the second novel I have podcast fully. And um, yeah, pretty outstanding. Again, thank you to everybody for all of your help, assistance, support, enthusiasm, just for checking it all out. And I hope you guys have a good new year, 2012. Here we go. I guess if you're going to listen to one you know, novel as your last novel, The American's not a bad one to go with, all right? Because <laughs> you know the world's going to end. 
No, it's not. That's just dumb. That's crazy. That's just silly. Where would we, I mean, there wouldn't be any, any good stories that the world just ended. Then post-apocalypse would just be apocalypse without the post. There's no after. All right, I'm rambling again. But hey, it wouldn't be a podcast without me rambling. All right. Thanks, everybody. As always, enjoy. Cheers, y'all. Chapter 35 The hole was breached from above on the furthest back HAV, and the Agori pounced on the occupants. Mutated arms and claws slashed and hacked at the Americans, ripping into their flesh, rending limbs and flaying skin. Despite the ferocity of the Agori, the Americans fought, guns ablaze, but the metal was useless against the acidic fluids that dripped from talons and teeth. Everywhere, holes burned and spread. Through seats, the hole, crates, arms, chest, legs, heads, weapons, everything was melted into a pool of B.C. flesh and bone. When the last person stopped moving, their final scream silenced as their vocal cords melted. The Agori roared as one and fed. They lowered their deformed heads to the ground and drank from the gooey ichor, not stopping until it was gone. Those that didn't get their fill turned away to pursue more victims. Those that did get their fill lurched and jerked as their bodies absorbed the B.C. that had been in the pools of liquid. Their skin took on a metallic sheen, while their claws and teeth lengthened further, hardening until the edges became finely honed blades. None of them noticed their transformation. Their animal brains focused only on killing and devouring. But they all took advantage of their increased skills, attacking with greater ferocity and cutting down all in their path. Help me get this on, Desmond cried as Billy, Melissa, and Beth finished fitting their suits. We're not all ghosts. Melissa reached over and touched Desmond's suit, the BC shrinking to fit, and activated his faceplate, sealing the man inside what they all hoped would be protection from the Agori. Desmond winced as the suit connected to him. I've only done this for ghosts, so I don't know how well the suit will work for you, Melissa warned. I did try to tweak it so you can control it from your jack points, just like a shock suit. I haven't used a shock suit since basic, Desmond said. I hope I don't blow myself up. Yeah, if you do, try to take some of them with you, Billy joked. No one laughed. Geez, lighten up, people. So what's the plan? The sound of collapsing metal came from the front, and they watched as pieces of the HAV's hull fell onto the driver's seat. The plan is to get out of here, Melissa said. We need to get to another HAV and get moving. Do we know how many people we have left? Beth asked. The column is out. Desmond said. I've been trying, but I can't raise anyone. Does that mean they're all dead? Billy asked. All of them? It means the calm is out, Desmond scolded. Don't make more of what I say. It's, it's annoying. You don't know the half of it, Melissa laughed. It stopped short when more of the HAV began to dislodge. Desmond, your suit has small guns built into the arms. Fire them just like a shock suit. Everyone else can form them as needed. Let's move out. Melissa kicked the ramp controls and the back began to descend. Agori were waiting and several clambered at the ramp as it fell, climbing over the metal and onto the HAV. Fuck! Melissa screamed, opening fire on the creatures. The other three joined, their bullets impacts knocking the creatures back outside. Melissa leapt at the controls and struggled to get the ramp back in place. Beth concentrated, overriding the mechanics and morphed the ramp closed, sealing it completely. Thanks, Melissa said. You okay? Beth nodded, but the exertion showed on her face. I'll be fine. Now what? Desmond asked. Acid dripped from above onto Desmond's faceplate and they all froze, waiting to see if it would eat through Melissa's design. The faceplate sizzled, but soon the acid stopped and the suit's integrity was kept intact. Great job, Billy said. Wish we could do that with the HAV. Beth sighed. We can. No, we can't, Melissa snapped. You don't have the energy to do this whole HAV. I do, Billy said. I'm the vehicle expert. He stepped to the wall and put his hand against it. Just change a little, and I'll duplicate the process throughout. Then what? Desmond asked. We'll, we'll just be stuck here. They go away at sunrise, right? Billy asked. We can wait that long. We assume they do, Desmond insisted. What if they don't? Then we deal with them then, Melissa shouted. Shut the fuck up and get out of the way. She shoved Desmond to the side and placed her hand on the HAV's hole, her other hand firmly in Bess, transforming a meter square into the acid-resistant material. There. Do it now, Billy. Billy concentrated on the HAV's design, focusing on every small detail of the hole, making sure he didn't miss anything. 
The group could hear the Agori's claws tearing into the metal, then screeches of rage and anguish as they were cut off by Billy's work. Behind them, a fist punched through the main hatch, but was severed and fell to the floor as Billy completed the transformation. The grotesque claw opened and closed for several seconds before falling still in its own smoldering juices. Damn, that fucking stinks, Melissa cried. I can smell it through the suit. The group listened to the Agori's relentless attack. The sounds of rage grew and grew, the HAV shaking violently as the creatures pounded and assailed the vehicle. Parts of the hull buckled inward from the force of the attack, but the structure held. How long until sunrise? Billy asked. Two hours, Desmond responded. Okay, okay, Billy muttered. We, we can wait two hours. Yes, Billy, we can wait two hours, Melissa mocked. Do you need a blankie? <laughs> Fuck off, Mel, Billy grumbled. <laughs> The spiders stopped at the crest of the hill, their sensors checking the area below. The scans puzzled them. They could tell from the collateral damage that people had been butchered, but there were no signs of corpses, only destroyed HAVs and dozens of unknown life forms that didn't register in their databases. The spiders instantly formed a plan of attack between them and moved off the hill, spreading out so they could ensnare as many creatures as possible. Billy cocked his head to the side. You hear that? The sound of your cowardice? Yes, it's deafening, Melissa laughed. Funny, Mel. No, seriously, I hear something out there. How can you hear anything through the hole and over the sound of those things? Beth asked. I can barely hear myself think. A uh, survival instinct, Billy answered. You live on the fringes like I have and you pay attention to every sound coming at you. It could mean death. Yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to narrow the death sounds down out there. Desmond said, you sure you're hearing something? No, I'm not sure. That's why I fucking asked you guys. The noises from the Agori stopped. Um, did I do that? I doubt it, Melissa said. Any chance we can get the hollow up and running so we can see what's going on out there? Mag drive is shot, Desmond answered. We have no power. I'll make a hole, Beth said, getting to her feet and turning a small part of the hole opaque. I, I don't know if it will hold against their devil juice. <laughs> devil juice. Melissa giggled. I like that. The four squeezed together and nearly lost all hope at the sight they saw. Oh, that's not good, Billy said, turning from the impromptu porthole and leaning against the hull. Out of the fire. The Agori were confused. They could see the metal creatures and their mutated brains told them that they weren't food, but there was a scent that drifted on the wind telling them different. The hunger for flesh kept them focused on the spiders, even though they could not see the flesh. The several dozen agori moved away from the HAVs, their many limbs scrambling over the hard red earth. Corrosive saliva dripped from their grotesque mouths and massive drooling globs singeing the ground and leaving a smoking trail behind them as they slowly closed the distance between themselves and the spiders. Okay, we can't stay here, Billy announced. We have to take advantage of the distraction because once the spiders win, they'll be on us. Very astute, William, Melissa sneered. And how do you propose we escape? Walk out of here? Billy looked sheepishly at Beth. I can fix this thing. But the problem is the devil juice corrupts the BC and I have to separate that out, which doesn't leave enough to work with. I need more BC. No way, Melissa yelled. She's not strong enough. I can do it, Beth said quietly obviously weakened from the exertion it took to make the porthole. No fucking way, Melissa shouted. Desmond put a restraining hand on her shoulder and she shoved it away. Fuck off! It's okay, Mel, Beth assured. If I can get us enough BC, then we can get the hell out of here. I'll rest while we run. When we're on the board the ships, I can, I can sleep as long as I need to. Melissa looked as if she would explode with rage. She turned from Billy to Desmond to Beth and back several times before finally throwing her hands up in disgust. Fucking fine! Kill yourself! She yelled at Beth. Make all the lives that died to get you here mean nothing. She'll be fine, Mel, Billy said. I'll, I'll pre-program the BC we have now, so all it will need is the extra mass. I'll make sure Beth only has to move the minimum. Melissa glared at them all. The spiders opened fire when the Agori were only a few meters away. They did not expect the lack of results from the attack. As one, they shifted tactics, turning flames on the creatures that now were rushing full speed towards them. 
scorching the green-black skin of the Agori. The creatures screamed and writhed, but were only slowed down slightly, their undead bodies regenerating the crisp skin once they pushed past the flames. The roars of the Agori swelled, and in a convergence of high-tech metal and putrid reanimated flesh, the two groups slammed into each other. Just go slowly, Billy soothed. Can, can you feel the other HAVs? Yes, Beth answered, her eyes closed and brow furrowed. But, but there's so much damage, it's hard to separate the corrupted parts from the rest. Melissa began to protest, but Billy held up his hand. That's fine. Just concentrate on melting the good parts, Billy continued. Liquefy the metal and bring it to us. Take your time. Desmond watched the battle rage outside the HAV. Don't take too long. I don't know who's going to win, but this isn't going to last forever. Three Agori converged on a single spider dodged its slashing legs, and leapt onto the machine's back. Their claws and drool burned through the BC, and they ripped into the heart of the creature, tearing a struggling pink form that was once a man from the safety of its shell. The cybernetically transformed human put up a feeble fight, but it was over in seconds as the Agori dissolved its flesh and drank the liquid. Several spiders changed tactics fully, banding together into a tight-knit circle, not letting the Agori get the upper hand. They held the undead mutants at bay with a coordinated defense of fire and brute force, not trying to kill the creatures outright, instead flinging them as far away as possible. But the Agori were relentless. For every one that was tossed aside, three more took their place, especially once they realized the scent was coming from inside the hard BC ex exoskeleton. Spider after spider fell, their soft, fragile bodies ripped from the protection they had each known for so long, and devoured. Despite the drug-induced, torturous existence they led, all of them fought for their lives. They were brief struggles, but proved enough of a distraction to let the surviving spiders adapt to the Agori's physical defenses. Mutated heads began to burst as the spiders adjusted the composition of their ammunition, creating incendiary rounds that could destroy the monster's brains before the corrosive effects of their bodily fluids melted the slugs. Without their brains, the Agori could no longer regenerate and were nothing more than bags of dead, rotted meat. The spiders have adapted, Desmond shouted. This is going to be over soon. Perspiration beaded on Beth's forehead and trickled down into her closed eyes. Melissa reached out and wiped the sweat away. How close are you? Melissa asked. Close, Beth whispered. It's almost here. A shiver ran through Beth's body and she struggled with consciousness. Her eyes flew open and Melissa could see the pain and pleading in them. I'm sorry, Mel. Beth's eyes fixed on Mel's and glassed over. Beth? Melissa shouted. Beth? Freak? Wake up! Melissa shook Beth's still body, then put her head against her chest. She isn't breathing! Desmond moved from the porthole and shoved Melissa out of the way. I did a tour as a medic. Move! Desmond began pumping Beth's chest, counting out the compressions, then listening to her chest for a heartbeat. Come on! The sound of the rear ramp unsealing and descending got Melissa's attention, and she jumped to her feet. What the fuck are you doing? Billy turned, and his eyes were sad, but strong. I can see the BC, Mel. You get Beth back and stay put. I'll move it over and make sure this thing works again. I won't be long. You're leaving me? Melissa screamed. I won't be long, Mel, I promise. They both knew that was a lie, and Melissa struggled against the weakening in her knees. Love you, Billy. You too, kiddo, he replied as the ramp raised into place. Thank you. The sounds and smells of the battle made Billy gag. He wished he could cover his nose and mouth, but the faceplate prevented that. He focused on the stream of BC only a couple meters from the HAV, ignoring the screeches and cries. The smell of burning flesh and corroding metal wafted over him, and he struggled to ignore that also, but his gorge rose in his throat, and he prayed he wouldn't puke all over the inside of his suit. He reached for the BC and made contact, bringing the pool to life and sending it twisting in a shiny flow towards the HAV. Every second felt like an eternity, and he kept his head down, watching only the BC. Most of the metal had joined with the HAV before they found him. Billy could smell the fetid creatures coming at him, and he whirled around just as one lashed out, swiping him across the chest. While the suit held against the talons, the force knocked him away from the BC, and the metal froze in place, no longer flowing to the HAV. 
Desmond leapt away from Beth's body and rushed to a cargo crate, grabbing out a small mag generator. What are you doing? Melissa yelled. Cut her suit open, Desmond demanded. Melissa glared. Just do it! Melissa growled and sliced Beth's suit open, spreading the material wide as Desmond knelt down and placed two leads directly on her exposed chest. Throw some BC on those to keep them in place and stand back. Melissa did as she was told and Desmond activated the generator, shutting it down almost as soon as he turned it on. Beth's back arched, raising her off the floor and then slammed back down. Desmond checked for a pulse and frowned. He activated the generator again and once more Beth's body arched and fell. Still no pulse. Fuck! Desmond cursed. What am I missing? Her body is different! Melissa exclaimed. She's not like us! She shoved Desmond to the side and placed a finger on each spot of BC. She closed her eyes and concentrated. Oh, Mr. Lang's biology class better not fail me now. Blood welled on Beth's chest at the contact points. Melissa stepped back. Try it now. What did you do? Desmond asked before flipping the switch. Shut the fuck up and shock her! Melissa yelled. Beth's body arched and convulsed and the HAV filled with the smell of singed skin. Beth's eyes shot open and she gasped for breath. Her hands found the BC contacts and she clawed at them. They shot from her body and Melissa and Desmond had to duck to keep from being hit by the wires. Melissa rushed to Beth's side and cradled her head, closing the open suit and covering her smoking chest. Shh, she she soothed. Shh, just relax. You're back now. It was all black, Mel. Beth sobbed. There was nothing there. I just floated in the blackness and was almost gone. I knew there wasn't a heaven, Desmond muttered, but shut up quickly when Melissa shot him a look of death. Sorry. It's going to be all right, Melissa insisted, stroking Beth's hair. We're gonna get you out of here. Beth tried to smile, but slipped into unconsciousness, her mouth turning into a frown instead. <laughs> Billy struggled against the agori that pounced on him, his arm reaching for the BC, only centimeters away. The agori became enraged that they couldn't pierce Billy's suit and slammed their fists and claws into him again and again. Billy felt ribs crack and knew from the excruciating pain that more than one vital organ had burst. He tried his hardest to ignore the pain and focus on the BC. One of the creatures kicked him in the side of the head and his body shifted just enough so he could touch the BC. The metal began flowing again, and Billy willed it away as fast as possible. The creatures ignored the shiny stream that connected to the HAV. Their attention focused only on Billy. They snatched him up and battered his body back and forth between them. Billy felt something snap, and his legs went numb. He started to cough up blood, and his faceplate was soon covered in a fine spray of red-black. The force of their attack was so fierce and constant that his body could no longer regenerate. He tried to change his suit to make some blades or weapons to fight the Agori off, but he was too weak. Another snap, and he went numb from the chest down. Fuck you, he whispered, before his neck snapped and the life faded from his eyes, leaving nothing but burst capillaries and dilated pupils staring out at the monsters. The HAV shuddered. Melissa held onto Beth as the metal about her began to change and morph. You should probably get in the driver's seat, she shouted at Desmond. The man stalled for a moment, then shook his head. Right, 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 yeah, we aren't dead. Right. He stumbled and staggered his way to the front, stepping over holes that opened and closed at random as the fresh BC repaired the corroded areas. He shoved debris from his seat and tried activating the ignition, but the vehicle didn't respond. We're still offline, he shouted back. Give it time, Melissa yelled back. Billy will get it working. Mentioning her uncle's name brought a fresh wave of grief, and Melissa hugged Beth closer to her. We'll get it working. The windshield repaired itself, and Desmond tried to keep it together as he watched the violence unfolding before him. Spiders laid waste to the agori while agori ripped open spiders and feasted. Blood, guts, metal, and acid flew everywhere, and Desmond became dizzy trying to keep track of all the movement. An alarm sounded, and Desmond looked down to see systems quickly coming back online. He punched the ignition and the HAV's mag drive kicked back to life. We're in business! He ran the fastest diagnostic checklist of his career and had the HAV ready for departure in seconds. He slammed the accelerator home, then hit the brakes. Fuck! I'm gonna need help! Melissa carefully set Beth's head down on the floor of the HAV and rushed to the front, taking control of the weapon system. I don't have her secured back there, so take it easy! Desmond glared at her. Really? Melissa shrugged. 
do what you can. I'll do the same since we only have the ammo that tears welled in her eyes as she watched the weapon system indicate it was fully loaded. Thank you, Billy. Melissa focused the targeting system at the group of spiders covered with a gory that rushed the HAV. The windshield lit up with target confirmations and Melissa fired half the battery of missiles at the creatures of metal and flesh. The projectiles rocketed away from the HAV, impacting into the bodies, spreading their various parts across the landscape and splattering the windshield with gore as the HAV barreled through the debris. Fucking great shooting, Desmond shouted, swerving the vehicle to the right to avoid a second group. Melissa painted those targets and sent the rest of the missiles at them before they could pursue. Scans show only seven spiders left, Melissa announced. I can't tell how many agori there are, but I don't see movement. She looked over at Desmond as the man concentrated on navigating them up over a hill and through a dry gully beyond. I think we did it. Did we do it? Desmond was quiet for a few minutes. Melissa thought maybe he hadn't heard her until he finally responded through gritted teeth. I'm not answering that question until we're out of this piece of shit and on a transport ship. We'll check Beth and get back up here to keep me awake. We're less than two hours away, but as soon as the adrenaline wears off, I'm going to crash hard. Don't you have your injector? Do you really think I kept up with that? It's rolling around back there somewhere. If you find it, I'll use it so you can get some sleep. Otherwise, you're going to have to run your gums to keep me focused. Melissa smiled. You may be the first person that is asking me to talk and not telling me to shut up. Desmond glanced over at her. How old are you? Seventeen, she narrowed her eyes. Why? Pity, he grinned. <laughs> Pity for you, since I don't go for old men, she laughed, getting up from the weapons console. She gripped his shoulder and leaned in, kissing his cheek quickly. Who knows, though? In a couple years, you may be my type. I'm fickle, and my tastes do change. Desmond patted her hand and let her slip to the back. Beth lay crumpled against a crate and Melissa rushed to her, relieved when she felt the warmth of her body. Beth, a freak, you in there? Beth stirred but didn't wake. Melissa pushed her hair from her face and dragged her over to the bench seats, grabbing the top part and pulling down a bunk. She struggled to get Beth up in the bunk, but finally was able to get her settled, debating whether to strip her suit off, but decided to repair it instead, in case they ran into more trouble. Melissa curled up next to Beth on the bunk, promising herself she'd get up in just a minute and join Desmond. She was soon fast asleep. A jarring impact brought Melissa out of a violent dreamscape where she wasn't sure if she was being pursued to be eaten or pursuing others to eat them. Once she had shaken the sleep from her head, she bolted upright, realizing they weren't moving. Desmond! she screamed, running from the bunk to the front of the HAV. Desmond lay slumped over the console, drool dribbling from his mouth and onto the controls. His snores nearly shook the vehicle. Melissa sighed in relief that she was still alive, but that relief was quickly gone as she looked out the windshield. Desmond! she shouted, shaking the driver harshly. Desmond, wake up! We've crashed! The man stirred and smacked his lips. Oh, fuck. My head feels like shit. My mouth tastes the same. He blinked his eyes rapidly at the windshield. What the fuck? Yeah, that looks like sand, Melissa snapped. You fell asleep and crashed us into fucking sand. Hey, I, I warned you I needed you to keep me awake. He checked the systems and smiled. It looks like I've only been asleep for about 15 minutes. There's no damage to the HAV, so we must have just coasted into a dune. Dune? Melissa asked. As in beach? Desmond stared at her for a moment like she was an idiot, then realization dawned on him about what his words actually meant. Holy shit, yes, the beach! He leapt from his seat and raced Melissa to the rear ramp. They both hit the controls at the same time and the ramp descended halfway, held up by another dune behind them. The two scrambled over the ramp and onto the sand, grasping for purchase as their fatigued bodies soon tired from the exertion of climbing. When they finally reached the top, they could see the HAV's tire track stretching for a mile behind them, then lost as the ground became hard dirt. The sound of waves crashing and ocean birds calling made them both turn around. Melissa grabbed Desmond's hand when they saw the ocean stretching off into the horizon. They stood there gazing out into the bright blue and white of the ocean waves. Hands grasped and fingers entwined, until Desmond was brought out of his reverie by the faint buzzing of a voice coming from the HAV below. 
He activated his comm, connecting with the HAV's communication system. Attention, American HAV number HCL-951. Attention, American HAV number HCL-951. Please respond with your security code immediately. This is Private Desmond McHale, and I haven't a fucking clue what the security code is. I have Ghost Melissa Brenton with me and Vessel Elizabeth Laughlin. We're all that's left of the American convoy. There was a pause, and the calm squawked fiercely in Desmond's ear. Private McHale, this is Colonel Blue Masterson. Did you say you were all that's left? Yes, Colonel. And you have the vessel with you? Yes, sir. You have a sample of the nanotech also? We're fine, Colonel. Thanks for asking. The Colonel chuckled. Sorry, son. It's been one shit fuck of a few days. I'm glad you three made it. Did you say you had a Brenton with you? Yes, sir. Melissa. Desmond squeezed Melissa's hand and she watched his face, trying to gauge the conversation from his reaction so she didn't have her calm with her. Do you know what happened to her aunt, Heather Walton? Yes, sir. She died in combat. Helped save our butts so we could get out of Tibet. What about the package she was carrying? The nanotech? We have a sample on board, sir. There's also some developments with that tech you'll want to see. Developments? Last time someone told me there were developments, I was slapped with a paternity suit. Wasn't mine, but sure did give me a scare. Desmond remained silent, unsure how to respond. Listen, Private, my nav tech tells me we have a lock on your location. We'll be there in 30 minutes. You just hold tight, understand? Understood, sir. Thank you, sir. We look forward to getting right the fuck out of here. Copy that, Private. See you in 30. Calm went dead and Desmond turned to Melissa, a huge grin spreading across his face. Damn. I wish I wasn't six years your senior. I'd give you the best kiss in the world. Are they coming? They'll be here in 30 minutes. Melissa jumped up and hugged Desmond around the neck, kissing his face. Their lips brushed against each other, and she playfully pushed him away. I outrank you anyway, she laughed. You need to be at least an officer for anything to work. He squeezed her hand once more and let it fall away. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I'm due for a promotion after this hell. Too true, Melissa laughed, slip-sliding her way back down to the dune to the HAV. Let's pack up what we can and get Beth ready. Yes, sir, Desmond winked, following the ghost down the sand and into the back of the HAV. When the amphibious personnel carrier finally came ashore, Desmond had to restrain Melissa as the medics carried Beth away. But she's my freak and I'm staying with her, Melissa screeched, fatigue and shock finally taking over. I'll fucking get them all if they hurt her. Melissa, Desmond shouted, get a hold of yourself. They're American medics. They're not going to harm her. Well, I can see you're related to Heather, Colonel Masterson said, stomping through the sand towards them, his hand extended. Desmond gave a quick salute, but Blue waved it away. Shake my hand, son. There's too few of us left to stand on ceremony. Desmond gripped the colonel's hand. Thank you, sir. It's been quite a ride. Blue turned to Melissa. Sorry about your aunt. She was a fine ghost and amazing woman. Yes, she was, Melissa replied. I lost my uncle, Billy Brenton, too. He saved our asses, Desmond added. He went above and beyond. Really? Doesn't sound like him, but I guess these days really put everyone to the test. The colonel saw the look of disdain on Melissa's face, and, and he held up his hands. I'll make sure he is remembered with everyone else, and his record reflects him in a, well, more positive light than it has. Thank you, colonel. Melissa said, taking a deep breath and hanging on to Desmond. Well, let's get you two aboard, the colonel ordered. We have 16 ragtag ships out there that are ready to get to Australia. I'd be lying if I said we don't expect trouble along the way. But we're Americans, and trouble seems to be our business. That it is, sir, Desmond replied as they trudged to the APC and boarded the craft. The back hatch closed and sealed, and the vehicle powered back into the surf heading for the fleet where the future of the Americans would be decided, for good or bad, by a handful of refugees, techs, troopers, and ghosts. Epilogue The three stood on the roof of the Beijing high-rise and lifted their glasses. To us, Mr. Plain toasted, and to profit. Profit beyond imagination, Mr. Continental added. Not bad for a month's work. Cheers, Mr. Brown Eyes finished for them. They clinked their glasses and each sipped, their eyes locked on the still smoldering city below them. 
Their shock troops had long since defeated the Chinese forces and were now putting the city back together, but it was a slow process. From here, we can keep Europe and still move across the Pacific and take the Americas, Mr. Brown Eyes said after finishing his drink. That's still the plan, Mr. Continental asked. Why wouldn't it be? Mr. Plain inquired. There are resources there that haven't been tapped in centuries. Brazil and Mexico will not be pleased, Mr. Continental said. I don't want us to spread ourselves too thin. Hard to be spread thin with our recruiting tech, Mr. Plain grinned. Very true, Mr. Plain, Mr. Continental conceded, just being cautious. And we appreciate you for that, Mr. Brown Eyes smiled, filling each of their glasses once more. But with the American forces on the run for the time being, I don't think Mexico and Brazil will be issues. They raised their glasses once again. Desmond wrapped his arms around Melissa as they stood on the deck of the command ship AFS Silverthorn and looked at the massive wall of Australia that loomed on the horizon. That's something you don't see every day, Melissa said. Could have used a wall like that to hide behind while we were getting our asses handed to us out here this past month. I think we did pretty well against the three ships, considering, Desmond said. They turned tail, finally, at least. Not without a lot of American casualties, though. Lives we couldn't afford to lose. Only one I care about is right here, Desmond said, nuzzling his face against Melissa's neck. It's all that matters these days. Hey, stop it, Melissa protested. Your eye patch scratches. Desmond rubbed harder, squeezing his arms so she couldn't get away. Oh, I'm so sorry my affliction irritates you. He spun her about and planted a quick kiss on her lips, then spun her back again. Melissa laughed heartily and elbowed him softly in the ribs. I guess I can forgive you since you're such the naval hero now, Lieutenant McHale she said. You'll be getting your ocular jackport in place soon, so I guess we should enjoy the patch while we can still play pirate and wench. Yeah, can I be pirate next time? Desmond asked. That wench outfit rides up. You wish, she giggled. There you two are, Bess said as she stepped onto the deck. Hey, you shouldn't be up here, Melissa scolded. Can't stay below forever, Beth complained. It smells down there. Can't argue with that, Desmond laughed. They done running tests? Melissa asked. Beth laughed. Hardly. Lou has me doing memory drills this week. He wants to see if I have any residuals from the Caprizi persona. Anything to keep, give us a leg up when we finally get to North America. Desmond suddenly pointed at, out at the wall. Here they come. Hope the Aussies are friendly, Melissa said. I don't think we have much fight left, us, left in us after these past few weeks. Speak for yourself, Desmond said, puffing his chest out. Old one-eyed Des is always ready for battle. You are so lame, Melissa laughed. Please don't ever do that again. The attention signal blared over the loudspeakers. All hands to stations! All hands to stations! Guess we need to go below, Desmond said, taking Melissa by the hand and offering his elbow to Beth. She took it and smiled. How many ships are we looking at, Wells? Colonel Masterson asked. Ten, sir, Ensign Wells answered. All battleships. Armed, fully and active. Guess they don't quite trust us, Lou mused. Can't blame them. Are they answering hails? Yes, sir, Wells responded. We're to hold present position while they approach. Easy enough. Any other chatter on the wire? No, sir. Their ships are staying quiet. The Ensign cocked his head slightly. Scratch that, sir. I am picking up a faint signal. Not sure it's coming from the Australians. Dial it in and put it on speaker, Blue ordered. Wells did as he was told, and a faint voice could be heard coming from the bridge's comm speakers. Can you clean that up? Wells worked for a short time, and the signal became noticeably clearer. Is that? Wells asked aloud. That's singing, Blue answered as the entire bridge crew puzzled at the song. Nothing I've heard before. Hail them, and let's see if we can get a response. Attention! This is AFS Silverthorn. Please identify yourself. The singing suddenly stopped. Again, this is AFS Silverthorn. Please identify yourself immediately. Um, hello? The voice asked. Who is that? Matty? Are you fucking with me again? This is Colonel Blue Masterson, commanding officer of the American Forces Fleet. Identify yourself immediately. You do realize I have complete control over all the stronghold systems, right? Keep it up and I'll shoot your ass off, Jespers. Blue furrowed his brow. 
Who the fuck is Jespers? He asked, but Wells and the others only shrugged. Again, this is Colonel Blue Masterson. Please identify yourself. Well, this is Brigadier General Jethro. Go fuck yourself. Blue? Really, Matty? You couldn't come up with a better name than that? Son, I don't know who the fuck you are, but you better start talking straight or you're going to get one giant hunk of B.C. up your ass, Blue roared. B.C. in the ass? What the fuck does that even mean? Have you been into Jay's shine again? Sir, the Australians are hailing us, Wells interrupted. Tell them to hold, Blue snapped, turning his attention back to the voice. Did you hear me? You're going to tell me who you are right now or I swear to God I will hunt your smart ass down and kick it all over the globe. The line was silent for a moment. This isn't Maddie, is it? I don't know who the holy fuck Maddie is. Now tell me who you are, or get me someone else to speak to that isn't mentally impaired. Um, yeah, right. Uh, please hold. The signal filled with soft music, and Blue nearly put his fist through the communications console. Get me a lock on that signal now. The second we get done with the Australians, I want this motherfucker found. Hello? This is Commander James Caprizi of the Mech Stronghold. Who am I speaking to? Realization dawned on Blue instantly. Caprizi? James? Caprizi? Uh, did I fucking stutter? Who the hell is this, and how did you get on this secure channel? Well, as I told the imbecile before you, Commander, this is Colonel Blue Masterson, commanding officer of the American Forces Fleet. Good to hear your voice, Caprizi. I've been hoping for this moment for a long time. Well, that makes one of us, Colonel. Caprizi answered, if you are a colonel, which I highly doubt since there is no such thing as the American Forces Fleet. Sir, Wells interrupted, the Australians? Tell them to hold on, Blue growled. Send our authentication codes to Caprizi right now. Wells shook his head, but did as instructed. Done, sir. Commander, we just sent you authentication codes. This should trigger all the information you need to verify. I am telling you the truth. He's right, Commander. Jethro's voice agreed. The codes just unlocked a data stream and... Oh my god. There was silence for a long while. Hello? Commander? Blue asked finally. Yeah, I'm here. Caprizi's voice answered, struggling to keep control. Uh, uh, am I reading this right, Colonel? The world isn't dead? <laughs> Far from it, Commander. Blue laughed. We're here. Although our numbers are a lot fewer than we'd like, we're down to ten ships from our original sixteen. Uh... I'm sorry. Did you say ships? As in on the ocean? That's where we like to put them, Commander. Sir, the Australians are insisting you speak with them now, Wells insisted again. Listen, Commander, I have some business to attend to, but I, I want your man, uh, Jethro, was it? Yes, Colonel. Jethro. Well, can Jethro stay on the line with Wells while I help solidify the Americans' place in the world? <laughs> you can have Jethro for all I care, Caprizi laughed. Hey, Jethro protested. What the fuck did I do? Um, that's great, Commander. I'll be back with you within the hour. I look forward to it, Colonel. Call me Blue. I'm James. Great to finally meet you, James. Hold tight. Blue looked at the expectant faces of the bridge crew and grinned. Looks like we're that much closer, people. The crew cheered. All right, Wells, I'm ready. Open the channel to the Australians. Let's get things rolling. We wasted 400 years already. It's time for the Americans to go home. You've been listening to the podcast reading of Jake Bible's The Americans. This novel and recording are protected under whatever latest, greatest Creative Commons license is out there currently. Share this all you want. Just don't even try to make a buck off it without the express permission of the author, me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, please go to jakebible.com. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this episode of the re-release of the original podcast production of The Americans. Don't want to wait each week for a new episode? Go to jakebible.substack.com and become a paid subscriber. Want more audiobooks? Go to jakebible.com for info and access to dozens of Jake Bible fiction audiobooks and ebooks. Cheers.